everyone. I can see you're starting to join in. Uh, welcome to today's session uh, from the Vines Against Women and Girls Network. Um, we are a network which is a focus on research around violence against women and girls and we're really here to um, encourage, facilitate and discuss very difficult questions and so we've been doing weekly seminars um, every other month and this is the second of the November presentations and we've got some amazing speakers for you today so I'm going to keep this very brief. Um, there is, I know, a range of knowledge within this audience and legal representation can be quite a difficult um, topic and it can be quite a uh, complex topic where we get bogged down in the nitty gritty. So we have given an extended runtime today so that hopefully there will be time for lots of discussion and um, the ability to kind of ask questions if we're not quite clear on anything. So please do use the Q&A tab on your screen if you have any um, sort of questions about what we're saying or if you want the panel to answer anything in particular in the second half of the um, session. You can also use, hopefully I can see that some of you are using the chat already to um, say hi and share um, any resources that you would like to share uh, that you think might be relevant to us. You may also spot that we have listened to your feedback and we have now um, started We've, we've got a system now where we're going to have live captioning that hopefully um, will help some of you to um, be able to participate even when it's a bit hard to keep um, listening. So it's not perfect, uh, particularly with names. It can be a bit of a, uh, an interesting uh, guess sometimes at what, what the person is saying. So as you can see, interesting guess. Um, so please just bear with us it's the best we've got for now and we will sort of look at it and see how it's working but for now hopefully uh, this will be a good way forward um, i would also just like to um say if you are going to use the chat the default system is that it sends what you what you write just to the panelists so please could you click and say to uh, send to all panelists and all attendees just because it means that then everybody can see the wonderful things you're saying um, before we start, I'll just give you a bit of an idea of how this um, session is going to look and then we will introduce our fabulous panellists. So we're going to have um, sort of five to ten minutes for each um, speaker to introduce themselves and say a little bit about legal representation for sexual offences. Um, I've asked them in particular to think about um, what they think the benefits might be and also where there might be some need to put some limits on legal representation. Um, we've also got some panellists from all of the different jurisdictions in the UK. So we've got Scotland, Northern Ireland and England and Wales represented here. And so there are slightly different approaches and we're going to make sure that you can um, hear about all of those different jurisdictions. So we'll, we'll look at the slight differences that there might be. Before we start as well, I would just like to um, really highlight that this is a free webinar. We are um, putting these sessions on for free every um, week at the moment. And if you have a little bit of money that you would normally use to spend to pay to go to events, then we would really, really like uh, for you to consider um, donating it to um, one of our members, um, Aisha Gill's uh, crowdfund uh, session. She's currently, they're currently just on uh, two and a half thousand Pounds, so they're about halfway to their target and they are trying to um, get enough money to create some resource packs for women and girls who are survivors of abuse but have no recourse to public funds and that's after a really successful um, previous session that um, created almost £16,000 of um, funds so it was amazing and we'd really really love it if you could continue to support that. I think um, we'll be putting the links to that in the chat so please do have a look. So Without any further ado, I will uh, introduce to you the uh, wonderful Sir John Gillen. Uh, Sir John has very kindly and very generously suggested we can call him John. <laughs> um, but for now, I'm going to keep saying Sir John, I'm afraid. Uh, so Sir John has spent 29 years as a barrister and then 18 years as a senior judge in Northern Ireland. He is uh, well known and well respected for his reviews of things like the civil justice um, courts in Northern Ireland. And then in 2018, he began a very wide scale 
re review of serious sexual offences in Northern Ireland and um, really examined very comprehensively the international best practice and the national evidence on the different ways and the different possible solutions that there might be to supporting uh, survivors better. So I will hand over to Sir John to, sorry, Sir John, uh, to tell us a little bit more. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, uh, the Criminal Justice Board of Northern Ireland commissioned me to carry out this independent review uh, into serious sexual offences in April 2018. Uh, I completed it in just under a year uh, with uh, 250 recommendations and uh, the report was approximately 600 pages in length. Uh, I believe this uh, commission reflected the reality that we live in an age of enduring and renewed sexual violence, which demands a, a profound overhaul of our criminal justice response to the whole concept of sexual assault. And in truth, the message of injustice that I discovered in the current system dealing with serious sexual offences was uh, deafening. Uh, indeed, my view is that we are in some ways going backwards. The number of reported rapes that result in convictions has been alarmingly low. The state of rape prosecution, certainly in England and Wales, and I think probably in Northern Ireland also, is um, abysmally low. It's at its lowest on record, whilst reported cases have been rising sharply. What are we doing in Northern Ireland? Well, um, in the wake of my uh, report, uh, a Gillen Review uh, uh, body was set up by the Department of Justice, and they are moving to implement uh, many of the, and hopefully all of the recommendations I made. And one of them is about independent legal representation. And they have just announced that there is going to be a pilot scheme now in Northern Ireland commencing on the 1st of April uh, 2021. And it will cover three things. First of all, it will cover a basic entitlement to relevant information and legal advice from the point when the report is made to the police, uh, and that'll be on behalf of the complainant. Secondly, there will be specific legal advice and advocacy uh, given on disclosure of evidence with reference to personal information that would engage Article 8 rights. That will be your, uh, your mobile phone records, your medical records, your counselling records and so on. And thirdly, there will be specific legal advice and advocacy uh, given to the complainant from the, right from the start about the introduction of previous sexual history. Uh, the number of hours uh, are going to be uncapped, uh, but the soft presumption is that it should fall within uh, four or five hours. Uh, who will be giving this independent legal representation? Well, it will be from three dedicated fixed term sexual offences legal advisors, SOLA, who will be employed within Victim Support Northern Ireland to provide advice and advocacy. Um, I, I, this was not the, uh, the, the state that I felt should have been. I should. I felt that, that um, uh, people who are facing um, QCs and so on for the prosecution and the defence should have an equal right to uh, whatever counsel they want. However, it is right to say that uh, it was felt that the legislation is needed to bring this advice within legal aid, um, that uh, providing uh, full-time employees within victim support might be uh, uh, better value for money, it might provide stronger cost controls and um, uh, the experience gained by those people working solely with serious sexual offences would perhaps arm them every bit as well as, as other counsel. Uh, there will be a separate funding pot to allow um, recourse to counsel in particularly uh, complex uh, cases. Um, the uh, legal representation um, will, however, be excluded from actual representation before the court. Um, the, uh, 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 the legal representation will be made via prosecution counsel. Um, uh, I'm unhappy about that. Uh, indeed, I think it's fundamental that the representative on behalf of the um, complainant should have the right to uh, make the representations. Uh, Crown counsel has got a completely different a task from that of representing the complainant. As you know, the prosecution counsel represents the state, uh, doesn't represent the complainant. Uh, the, the prosecution counsel has to look at the interests of the public, it has to look at the interests of the accused and so on. I believe it should be um, made, these representations should be made by the uh, representative of the complainant. However, I am told that 
Uh, this will be uh, eventually the rollout that will happen. Uh, it will require some measure of legislation, but it's hoped that this will be done at an early stage uh, in the process. Um, why do I think that independent legal representation is absolutely necessary? Well, um, I think for a number of reasons. Uh, briefly, they're as follows. First, I think it's one of the uh, confidence building blocks so absolutely vital in uh, re-establishing confidence in the criminal justice system for complainants. Um, as I've said, I believe at the moment the message of injustice in the current system is deafening. We need to have these building blocks. Uh, secondly, it will give, I believe, greater credence to victims' rights and interests. It's necessary to recognize the um, uh, triangulation of interests in the criminal justice system. It's not just the state, it's not just the accused, but it's also the complainant as well. Uh, thirdly, one has to recognize that this concept is neither no novel nor uncommon. It happens in Denmark, it happens in Norway, it happens in New South Wales, it's in Scotland, it's in Ireland, and so on. Uh, fourthly, I think that it has to be recognized that complainants feel vulnerable, they feel lacking in power, they feel that they're collateral damage, they feel that they're, um, uh, they can't go on with the process, and that's why there's a vast underreporting, vast dropout in the system uh, that there is. I believe with the presence of a lawyer there, uh, that will help the, not only the image, but it'll help the progress of the case. Uh, research suggests that independent legal representatives reduce secondary trauma, reduce the feeling of uh, attrition that these cases generate. Uh, next, I believe that it's vital that there be advice on the obligation to disclose personal data. I don't know of any other area of the law except this where your personal data can be looked at without you having the benefit of legal advice. Next, I believe it's vital for um, previous sexual experience. Again, I don't know any other area of the law, anywhere, where you, I can delve into your recent sexual experience without you having the right to have legal representative to uh, uh, represent, represent you in the court. Um, and uh, finally, I think that um, it's in fact in many ways a cost-saving operation and that's been proven in Ireland. Uh, you have legally trained advocates who will be there and who will ensure that questions are not rambling, that proper uh, uh, limits are placed on what is being done in court, particularly at preliminary hearings and so on. Um, and, and finally, uh, uh, we found in our review that the public response to this was overwhelmingly in favour. We had 419 respondents uh, coming back to us in our review. 90% of them agreed with independent legal representation. And I noticed that the survey, survey by Northern Ireland by the Victim Support Group found 80% believed that legal representation would have helped them in their case. What then is the, the limit on this? Well, um, in the initial stages, I believe that the limit perhaps should be that the representation is confined to the preliminary ground rule hearings and not at the trial itself. Uh, why do I believe that? I believe the danger there is that the jury become confused as to who is representing whom. Uh, I think that the, uh, there can be this dangerous overlap between what the prosecution are saying and what the um, uh, complainant's counsel may be saying. Um, uh, and so I, I think that, that it, it, it also I think that could elongate trials enormously. However, however, I'm not, I haven't got a closed mind in that. And I think we should progress this matter cautiously. Deal first of all with what I want in terms of the preliminary and ground rule hearings with your own counsel representing the complainant. Uh, and we'll see how things progress. Anyway, thanks very much indeed for listening to me. I think I've run over time a bit, but hopefully that's a synopsis of what my views are. Thank you so much, John. That is, you haven't run over, you've been very, very succinct and uh, I think really set out the kind of key benefits and the key justifications really clearly. Um, just before we move on to Harry, I think it's really, uh, I've just um, completed an evaluation of the Northumbria um, pilot of legal advocacy for rape complainants and one of the things that really came out of that for me was the need for um, being able to have a separate system to going via the, count, the Crown Council. Um, it really is worrying to me that the Northern Ireland pilot is going to not allow that ability to go into the, the ground rule hearings. My worry would be that that would 
effectively mean that all it's all we're ha doing is kind of saying we would prefer this and then the crown will decide and it may lead to sort of false expectations of the amount of representation they're actually going to get so i agree 100 yeah. and i'm hoping that's going to change yeah great thank you so much and we will hear more from you later uh, but for now we're going to hear from harriet wistrich who is the co-founder of the center for women's justice um, which began in 1990 as a campaign organization uh, for fighting for justice for women who had um, sort of fought back against violent men and then more recently has been holding the government to account for its responses to violence against women through legal action so welcome Harriet and we can't wait to hear from uh, you about what you've got to say thank you thank you very much Olivia and thank you for organizing this really important discussion um, so just a little bit of background about myself and uh, the Centre for Women's Justice so I'm, I'm a, a solicitor I've uh, been in practice for about 25 years, um, primarily working around um, actions against the police and holding uh, police, CPS and other state organisations accountable. Um, I've also, um, as you mentioned, uh, I, I was a founder of Justice for Women, uh, which was a campaigning group. And I, I did quite a lot of work uh, uh, over the years. I've, I've done quite a bit of work. Um, in, mainly in the appeal court uh, on behalf of, of women who've been convicted of murder for uh, killing uh, violent partners, uh, abusive partners. Uh, the most recent case, many of you will know, is uh, representing Sally Challen. And sometimes those cases spill over to um, retrials. Um, and so I have a little bit of experience as a, as a criminal defence advocate, but primarily um, the work and my work in this area is advocacy on behalf of uh, victims of uh, abuse and um, in, in terms of those wanting to take their cases forward in the criminal justice system. Um, I had started uh, doing work um, through my connections with uh, the women's sector really um, and uh, I became aware that there was there was very little legal advice at all for for victims of rape, sexual assault, domestic violence, and so on. Uh, there was lots of support work, but very little legal input. And I started advising in, in my um, legal aid practice um, some 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 women in relation to cases, and, and one of those cases. Um, what, what, involved the uh, war boys uh, the the taxi driver and uh, we 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 ended up bringing a case that went on for a number of years concluding in the supreme court um challenging um the police around the dreadful failures in their investigation and resulted in a quite important precedent ar around um the duty to investigate so um during the time that I, I've been advocating on behalf of, of those women, um, I felt that there was a massive gap and a need for, for um, support for uh, victims of violence um, to negotiate their way through the criminal justice system. And so in 2016, um, we established um, a new legal charity called the Centre for Women's Justice. So that's distinct from Justice for Women, which is a campaigning group. Centre for Women's Justice is um, a charity. Uh, we have a number of, uh, a growing number of uh, employees and um, we um, do, do a number of things. Um, we provide uh, training and um, uh, support to the front line. So in particular, we, we, we train ISVAs and IDVAs, um, which we'll come back to in a minute, I'm sure, um, it, it, in terms of uh, all the sorts of duties that the police and the Crown Prosecution Service have and other criminal justice agencies have, and, and ways in which you can challenge them ultimately through the legal system if necessary. Um, and we, we, we've also set up a, a lawyer's reference panel. So we have a lot of lawyers who are predominantly specialists in um, uh, legal advice around um, those sorts of failures and and uh, misconduct and judicial review uh, and so so we're able to to provide access to advice where where it's where it's needed where legal action is needed 
but also um, we have a, a we we do strategic litigation cases ourselves. So from the sorts of cases that we're seeing on the ground, uh, they feed into our um, assessment of, of where there may be a, a strategic a litigation challenge to bring. And one of one of the, the big cases that we've been working on for a number of years um, representing the End Violence Against Women Coalition uh, is a challenge to the Director of Public Prosecutions in respect of what we say uh, has been a change in policy or approach to uh, decisions around the prosecution of rape, which has led to a drastic um, collapse in the volume of rape cases prosecuted in the last three years. Um, so we've seen um, a, a, really a collapse um, from uh, about an average of three and a half, four thousand cases prosecuted in England and Wales per year down to, to, to under 2,000, so at, at least a 50% collapse. And, and, and the figures are certainly less than 3%, uh, some, some figures put it less than 1.5% of cases reported to the police. Um, are resulting in a, um, a prosecution or, or a conviction. And so um, that, that, that obviously um, is the context that we're working with. And of course, we know many women don't report rape, but of those that report, um, we have this um, sort of 97, 98% of cases not, not resulting in, in prosecution. Um, so, uh, and another, another piece of strategic litigation that uh, we brought was in relation to uh, digital disclosure and uh, the, the, the police and the Crown Prosecution Service had rolled out a new digital extraction form, which uh, we, we said was uh, unlawful, not, not in compliance with privacy uh, rights and with data protection rights. And, and in fact, at the time that we threatened judicial review, the Information Commissioner did uh, a study and uh, it, it, in fact they, they, they have had to withdraw that, that um, uh, the, the, the proposed form they were using and come up with something that was much more proportionate which we hope will reduce um, the sorts of extensive requests for digital data that were being asked of rape and sexual violence victims. Um, so there's, that, that's a couple of examples of, of, of the sorts of strategic litigation cases we're bringing. And um, in terms of the sorts of um, issues that we're asked to uh, advise on, I mean, we've had this huge growing number of, of what we call second tier uh, advice requests. We, initially, we did try to respond to, to people coming in through the door, but that's, that just kind of exploded. There is so much need for, for advice from, from women. We don't, we don't just deal with, um, uh, rape and sexual assault, but in fact, the vast majority of the sorts of uh, inquiries we get are around rape and sexual assault. We, do, we deal with all sorts of cases around violence against women, so we deal with domestic violence, stalking, um, and, and other issues as well. But, but in fact, the, 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 the majority of cases are, are around rape and sexual assault. And the, the, the particular issues that we, we, we put, we've ended up um, assisting with uh, either ourselves, but usually through referral on our, uh, our panel, is uh, the victim right of review scheme. That's the that's the biggest majority of cases, um, and, and um, that that is a. I, I don't know if it, it applies across uh, Northern Ireland and Scotland, but in England and Wales, victim right of review was introduced by the Crown Prosecution Service follows following a case in around 2013. And um, that applies, um, uh, uh, so, so you can challenge a decision not to prosecute. Uh, and, and the police introduced a similar scheme. So uh, a, a decision not to refer a case for, uh, to the Crown Prosecution Service uh, can also be ch challenged. And sometimes um, uh, those challenges are um, successful and, and result in a reconsideration. Where, where they don't, uh, we have sometimes assisted in judicial review, or, or some of the lawyers on our panel have assisted in judicial review of those decisions. Um, I'm conscious that um, I don't want to take up too much time. Um, and um, I, just, just on questions about legal advocacy, as, as I mentioned earlier, 
Um, we have um, ISVAs, Independent Sexual Violence uh, advisors, or sometimes they're called advocates, which is quite interesting, the difference in term. The, the role of the ISVA is um, limited, um, and, and I would say far too limited um, in, in terms of what, what they can do. Uh, they, are, they do perform a very, very useful role in terms of assisting uh, victims through the um, criminal justice process. But um, they, they, they are not allowed to discuss um, the, 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 the details of the case with, with the victim. Uh, and, um, you know, they're, they're, throughout the whole criminal justice process, victims are hugely inhibited by um, uh, not, not being able to discuss the case uh, with anyone for fear that, 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 that those discussions will become subject to to disclosure, um, uh, and um, you know, we we we've seen uh, many many victims have, have been advised or have feared going to counselling or therapy until uh, the end of their case um, because because of the the issues around disclosure around around that there was there was recently a, a consultation we contributed to on pre pre um, pre trial therapy, so. Um, uh, th those are just some of the issues. Um, I won't. I won't take up any more time at the moment. But um, I'm. I'm really happy to uh, join in the conversation after that. Thank you, Harriet. That's brilliant. And I think. I think I can just say a collective thank you to uh, you from everybody who's watching because I really do believe that the strategic litigation that the Centre for Women's Justice has done has been. Uh, it's. It's sort of achieved almost like 10 years of culture change within um, one action because it's sort of using the rather than trying to get training and, and change perspectives actually you're using the same perspectives that that people already have but you're just highlighting how actually if you really want to uphold the law this is what you do so yeah thank you so much um, and I think you you've mentioned a few things that I'm going to want to come back to and bring up but um i will make sure that i move on to uh, bonnie for now so that we can hear from everybody but thank you so our next speaker is bonnie turner who is a rape justice activist whose story made the front page news and i'm sure you would have heard about her she is a really eloquent speaker and has um recently had a documentary on sky news as well as speaking at various other places. Her um, hempy was Jeremy Corbyn and he tweeted a video um, for her in the um, 2019 election. In January, late January uh, next year, her personal rape case is going to be spearheading the um, legal action that Harriet was just talking about. And she's also got an open rape case in Norway, which puts her in a really unique um, and very unenviable position of having being able to compare the systems in Norway and England and Wales, where in Norway there is legal representation very um, clearly available, and in England and Wales where actually everybody has to really fight to be able to get it. So over to you, Bonnie, because you, you can say much more than I can. <laughs> oh, I think you're on mute. Hang on, let me see if I can un unmute you. Yes, thank you. Sorry. Okay, great. Um, Hi everyone. Um, so actually, Olivia, I can just, sorry, I'm just going to change the screen. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I had prepared something to say today, but I've decided to throw caution to the wind and just wing it. Because um, I actually found it incredibly overwhelming to try and write down what I've been through in the last decade. Um, I've actually been, uh, three different men have raped me in the last decade and I've made multiple attempts to report the rapes. So I know how the criminal justice system treats victims of rape. Uh, since last year, I've waived anonymity to advocate publicly uh, for the rights of victims. And in particular, I've actually been talking about the importance of having independent legal representation I do believe that it's crucial for a just system to ensure that victims of serious sexual offences like rape are afforded independent, uh, free of charge, or at least affordable uh, legal representation uh, at the very, very, very beginning of the process. 
uh, Harriet became my lawyer two and a half years into my second case, my case in the UK, uh, which was, you know, I'm so grateful that she is my um, lawyer now, but it was too far along in the case to uh, rectify what I think were irreparable um, issues or damage done to my case at the beginning uh, by the police and the Crown Prosecution Service. Um, but I'm going to go back to the beginning and hopefully you can follow this because even I get confused about all the things <laughs> that have gone on in the last 10 years, but uh, it's just to give you a picture of uh, what it's been like for me in my experience. So, as I say, about 10 years ago, nearly 11 years ago, in fact, I was raped by a man I'd known for over a decade in Norway. And uh, it was, I didn't report it straight away. Uh, I, I reported it a few years later when I unexpectedly ran into him and I realized that I couldn't pretend that it hadn't happened. So I made the decision to report and once I figured out how to call the police in Norway from abroad, I was told by them that I should report to my local police here in the UK. And so I reported it to the London Metropolitan Police. And that was with the now disbanded Sapphire unit, which is the, was the um, specialist rape, uh, rape police unit. And th they initially, things went well. They d conducted an interview with me in, uh, in person, uh, which was recorded on video. Uh, I didn't actually think to ask about, get legal advice or ask, uh, ask for a lawyer or anything like that until after the interview. And it was at that point that the police told me, oh, don't worry, you don't need a lawyer. You've got us. If this case ever gets to court, you've got us. And I naively believed them or trusted them. And then nearly a year later, the police uh, contacted me to say that the case was being dropped because it wasn't their jurisdiction and that I should go to Norway. So I felt incredibly let down to suddenly you know, be at the very beginning of things again. And the police also refused to uh, give me any information on how I should report to the police in Norway. I asked which police station I should go to, uh, whether I should make an appointment, uh, how long I need to go to Norway for. And I was willing to do all these things, but I didn't want a wasted journey there. Uh, the Met Police said, we can't tell you any of that. And I asked for the contact details of their liaison in Norway or for them to put me in touch with the, their liaison in Norway, and they refused. So I again ca called the police in Norway myself, and they uh, said, no, your local police should be handling this. I twice approached the embassy of Norway in London, and they ignored all my efforts to contact them, or they turned me away. So that was quite, um, yeah, as I say, I felt incredibly abandoned and it was around this time that I got involved with a man uh, who again I had known for a couple of years uh, and we became sexually involved and uh, I had you know I'd been quite vulnerable and became reliant on him he was like a best friend to me and he knew about the first rape and he knew that I had been unsuccessful in my attempts to um, report that. And seven months after we got involved, he came to London on a, uh, just, just to see me. And uh, he, when I was fast asleep in a city of London hotel room, uh, he raped me. And it was very, very confusing because I didn't actually wake up fully during the rape. I actually thought I was having a nightmarish dream. Uh, and I've since realized that it was probably a combination of the body's natural fear response to freeze. But also I found out this year from a sleep expert or a doctor in sleep that uh, 
the body, whilst in REM sleep, goes into, has, you have sleep paralysis. And so if I was wakeful and I was fast asleep, that's another reason why I couldn't move, why I couldn't scream. Uh, anyway, um, the weeks, the couple of weeks following that were very confusing. Uh, I still didn't really know if it happened or not. The next day, uh, he did say to me, he did ask if I was okay. And I said, oh, what you did last night's not okay. And he responded by saying, oh, so, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, but still, it took days for um, the shock to wear off. And it took about four days before I had my first panic attack in the middle of my sleep. And then um, it was two weeks after the rape when he was back living in his country um, of residence. Uh, so he lives in Japan. And he sent me messages and in an in a exchange of messages between us, he ended up effectively confessing to what he'd done uh, and apologizing. He even said in there, I'm so sorry for what I did to you, especially after all the things you told me before. So he himself is the one who's actually referring to the first rape that I had disclosed to him. So it was with that I decided to report to the police in the UK. And that was, yeah, in, in, uh, if I hadn't already been through enough, like it, the police process just made it, yeah, so much more difficult. Uh, firstly, the wrong police force was dispatched to my house. So that delayed the reporting process by another five days. Then the police kept me at the police station for a period of six hours. The actual interview went for five hours. So I had no break in those six hours, uh, no food, uh, just one hot drink was offered to me in those six hours. In the years since I've been diagnosed with uh, chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia, which I know I had at the time, I had the symptoms of at the time. So. I find it really concerning as well that the, there was no one there with me to ensure my welfare through that reporting process and to uphold my rights as I, as I was in a tra traumatised state trying to report. The police officer, uh, she also said to me, I'm not meant to tell you this, but I recommend that you don't do a video interview and that you do a written statement. And I trusted her and I regret that to this day because she took five hours to simultaneously kind of interview me um, and type. But she wasn't a good typer and she wasn't a good interviewer and she was trying to do both things at the same time. Uh, she frequently asked me to slow down, to stop, to spell words, to define words that she didn't understand. So it was an incre incredibly um, ineffective uh, approach, really. And at the end of those five hours, she said, uh, you could stay here in the interview suite or actually, no, come upstairs with me to the superintendent's office where the printer is uh, so that you can check it. And sorry, I forgot to say before that another reason that she recommended a written statement was that I would have the opportunity to review it before and amend it before it was finalized. So I went upstairs with her and on the wall of the, of the open plan police office was a celebrity mask of Jamie Dornan, the actor who plays a serial rapist and murderer in the fall. And he also plays a sexual uh, abuser in Fifty Shades of Grey. And then inside the superintendent's office, where I was sat uh, to read my statement, uh, was a fake Twining's tea bag box on the wall, flattened on the wall, and it said Twining's Fifty Shades of Earl Grey. So these were the conditions under which I was expected to review my statement. Uh, and as I checked through it, there were all sorts of errors and issues with it around uh, some factual areas, but mainly around nuance. 
Uh, but also, in hindsight, I realise I was kind of just rambling um, and not necessarily, I, I guess, in order to process things myself, I was talking about things that weren't necessarily directly relevant to what happened on the day of the rape, uh, which could potentially be used against me. Uh, so I really wish I'd had a lawyer with me to help keep the interview um, on track in a more boundary way. Um, and then there were many other issues, uh, well, and also, yeah, the, the police officer didn't allow me to make the changes that were needed. So to this day, that statement is the official statement, uh, and I've not had a copy of it, I've not seen it since, but two years after, after um, the Crown Prosecution Service made the decision to not prosecute the man who raped me even though he was never interviewed by British police. Uh, he was interviewed by the police in Japan, but um, they refused to do any sort of video or audio recording. Uh, and keep in mind that this person's also not a national of Japan uh, and he's Japanese, he's not good enough to be interviewed in Japanese. So my concern is that the interview questions would have been translated from English to Japanese to his language and back again. So I worry that a lot's been lost in translation, uh, linguistically, but also culturally in terms of um, uh, misunderstandings around rape culture, rape myths, this sort of thing. Uh, there were many other issues with this police officer. I don't have time to go into it now, uh, but I ended up putting in it, making a verbal informal complaint about her to uh, a victim support person that I was uh, getting some support from, just emotional support from. Uh, and that police officer was kicked off my case. But as I say, I think that irreparable damage has been done to my case because of that police officer. I don't understand how they can say it was his word against mine when, uh, as I say, he confessed in writing to me. Um, I'm mindful of time, so I'm going to go over to the Norwegian side and hopefully I'll have time to bring up some other stuff later. Um, but I think Har Harriet mentioned it before around um, access to independent sexual violence advisors uh, and uh, legal aid. But um, to keep it brief, I'll just say that I didn't have any access to independent sexual violence advisors until after my case was dropped. So that's two years down the track. Uh, all attempts I made to get telephone legal support uh, from services like Rights of Women, uh, they would typically open, I think, two hours once a week. Uh, and I, I know that on at least one occasion, I made at least 500 call attempts to get through to them uh, because they are so incredibly um, oversubscribed in terms of the demand for that service. Um, so over to my Norwegian case, uh, we circle back to it. And the reason for that is that last year I disclosed that to some uh, mutual friends of mine and the man who raped me. And one of my friends recommended that I speak to another friend and that friend found me a lawyer. And so last August, I found out that all victims of rape in Norway are uh, entitled to a state-funded lawyer. Uh, you get two or three hours of initial um, legal advice and support to help us figure out if we want to report or not. And then if we decide to go ahead with reporting, then it's uh, uncapped beyond that. And so my experience of going to Norway to report last September uh, was in stark contrast with what I've experienced with the City of London Police and the, uh, the, uh, with the City of London Police. Uh, so he told me in advance what would happen on the day. He explained that it was going to take uh, a long amount of time. And so he recommended that I bring my own food and water. Um, and he said to me that he'll make sure that we get regular breaks. He sat there um, 
and interjected throughout the interview to ensure that uh, I didn't say more than I needed to uh, and that the interview was you know, fair and reasonable um, and it wasn't sort of disproportionately invasive to my privacy or intrusive to my privacy. Um, so, yeah, I think for me that's really goes to show how vastly different it's been. It's too soon yet to tell whether it's going to have an impact on the outcome. Uh, my Norwegian case was actually dropped in February this year without the perpetrator being interviewed or any investigation being done. But my lawyer immediately appealed that decision for me and my case was reopened in September. Uh, so that's still ongoing. Um, but I guess I would say the most important aspects of having a lawyer are to prevent uh, the case from being tarnished or from being damaged, uh, but also to take on the huge administrative burden uh, that is uh, that happens with victims of rape like myself. Uh, it's I never made a formal complaint to the City of London Police for how my case was handled because I just didn't have the resources within me to go through even more paperwork and admin when I was just struggling to survive. So, yeah, I think um, I'll just finish there. I'm sure I've missed a lot of things, but I'm, as I say, I think that's enough time for me. Thank you. Bonnie, I could just spend the rest of the day reflecting on what you've said. I think it's so important that we hear what you've been through and what the reality is that we're talking about. Um, I think when we start talking about things like legal representation for rape complainants, it's really easy to get bogged down in the kind of really nitty gritty of the law. And actually, you have just perfectly explained why this is a conversation we have to have, that change has to happen. The status quo is not an option. And I'm just I'm really grateful that you've shared that with us and that I'm so sorry to have basically forced you to put five years of your life kind of thing like, you know, just sort of summarise it into 10 minutes, please. That's not happening. Um, but I'm really, really grateful. So thank you. Thank you. If I'll just mention one more thing, which I do think is important, is uh, after I'd gone through the Victims' Right to Review scheme uh, with the Crown Prosecution Service, uh, I was then advised that I needed to get a lawyer. And I, because I'm in receipt of disability and housing benefits, of social security, I couldn't afford to pay for a lawyer. So I had to get legal aid. But because of government cuts to legal aid, um, most legal, most law firms are not taking on legal aid cases. And I contacted over 40 law firms and I was turned away by every single one except for the Centre for Women's Justice. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it, it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what else can I say, really? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And it just shows you, doesn't it, that we, like, if the government are serious about saying that they take us seriously, then they're going to need to put their finances where their mouth is. Yeah. Okay, I don't really want to move on. I'm sorry. No offence to Sandy. Um, but I, I, just, I would love to hear what Sandy has to say. So Sandy Brinley is the Chief Executive of Rape Crisis Scotland, and she is a member of the advisory groups for the Scottish Law Commission, the Crown Office Reviews for Rape and Sexual Offences. She's a member of the Strategic Working Group to Improve Responses to Rape. She um, is involved in the government's, the Scottish Government's Joint Strategic Board on Violence Against Women and Girls and the Crown Office Expert Group on Sexual Offences. Uh, so she is um, thoroughly in the in the mix when talking about this sort of um, policy. So over to you, Sandy. Um, can't wait to hear what you have to say. Uh, I think that just makes it sound like I go to a lot of meetings, which is probably true. Um, th thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I want to speak a little bit about what's been happening in Scotland. M most of what I'm going to say actually relates to changes brought about by the courage and determination of individual women. So it feels really fitting that I'm speaking directly after Bonnie. Um, so I just wanted to say right at the start that Scotland has a completely different legal system 
So you hear people talking about UK conviction rates, UK responses to rape, that just doesn't exist. Um, so that doesn't mean that we don't have the same deep systemic issues and barriers in uh, responding to rape in Scotland, but we have some of the unique features of a response, for example, the not proven verdict, corroboration, 15 jurors and simple majority. Um, we also don't have ISVAs in Scotland. We have a really similar role, but it's all delivered by rape crisis centres across Scotland called advocacy workers that are part of a national project. We've got, by the end of the year, we have 40 advocacy workers supporting complainers from the start to the finish of the justice process, whatever that is. Um, and I think one of the really important things to say about this, and one of the really helpful things, is that because it's coordinated by Rape Crisis Scotland, it means we've got a really good overview of what the issues are facing complainers in rape and sexual offence trials across Scotland, and that complainers' experiences directly influence our policy and strategy work. And hopefully, from a brief input, I'll give some examples of why that's so important. So we've, we've had a number of developments in Scotland over the past four years around independent legal representation. The first was a really landmark case called WF against Scottish ministers. Um, and this was a case, it was a domestic abuse case where a woman received a notice that the accused wanted seven years of her medical and psychiatric records. So she went to see a lawyer who applied for legal aid, only to be told there was no provision for legal aid because there's no provision for representation in these circumstances. Um, they then applied to Scottish ministers who can make exceptional um, grants of legal aid. The Scottish minister said they weren't making it available because she had no right to be heard. And really, I think to think about that, about somebody that made a really serious criminal allegation against um, is trying to get seven years of your really personal, intimate records and you have no right to be heard is what the, the state tells you. Um, and I really want to pay tribute to the legal professionals involved in this case. Most of them worked pro bono and um, for a significant amount of time because they really felt there was a human rights issue here. So it went to judicial review. Um, we intervened, Jake Knight has got intervened in the judicial review. Um, and Lord Glenny and the judgment um, overturned the Scottish Minister's decision. He said that um, it's a clear violation of Article 8 rights to have your sense, medical sensitive records accessed and that um, a complainer should have a right to be heard. So this was a really landmark judgment. After the judgment, the Scottish Government introduced new legal aid regulations making legal aid available on a non means tested basis for these cases, like whenever somebody's sensitive records are being sought. And I think the non means tested is really, really important. But one thing I would say about WF is that it showed the gap between a right and how that right is realised, and that rights can be pretty meaningless unless there's really practical assistance for campaigners to access that right. So WF was in 2016, like the start of 2016, and it was only last month in October that we had a proper system of intimation put in place for the share of courts um, to let complainers know that they had a right to be heard, a right to object, and a right to legal representation. So it's a very positive case, but I would say there's been significant issues with implementation. Um, so that takes me on to the next um, case that was quite significant in Scotland, which was last year. It was an opinion by Lord Tyre, and it related to mobile phones. And what Lord Tyre uh, found was that a complainer should have a right to be heard um, in opposing defence attempts to get her mobile phone. But again, in this case, I think you can see the disjuncture between a right and what actually happened in the ground. So this is a case we were involved in through our advocacy project where I think the outcome would have been really quite different because what happened as I understand it was um, she, she was just basically the woman in the case was just left to find a lawyer herself um, I think that's totally useless given this is like it's a new area of law for the legal profession in Scotland it's really quite specialised she just found a lawyer um, who said there's nothing you can do whereas if we had been in contact with her we would have put in contact with a specialist legal team who would have made an application to Scottish ministers and if they refused legal aid um, 
would have judicially reviewed it and further debate the law. So there's in theory a possible right in Scotland for legal representation around mobile phones, but it's not really, I would say, yet being fully realised. And that then takes me on to the third case. Um, the, the obvious question in Scotland, I think, is if there's a theoretical um, right to legal representation for your medical records, a right for mobile phone data, what about sexual history and character evidence? I, I, it's hard to think of a more impressing potential Article A issue than having your sexual history and character brought up um, during a rape or sexual offence trial. So there was a case called RR. Um, the judgment was only issued um, last month in this and it's not yet been published, I, I don't think. But in RR, this is a woman in a complainer in a rape trial where um, she hadn't been informed by the Crown that her sexual history and application had been made to introduce her sexual history. Her accused hadn't been sought um, and she was informed four months after the fact that a judge had agreed to introduce two aspects of her alleged sexual history, alleged because she disputed it, it was around um, her sex. So we were in contact with the woman in this case and she said to us, is there anything I can do about this? And we thought there was definitely something she could do about it. So we took some legal advice and um, ended up, this is going to sound very arcane to known lawyers in the room, uh, the virtual room, we put, or she took a petition to the Nobel Ethicium, which is a procedure in Scottish law, it's a kind of like procedure of last resort, where you have no other remedy. Um, so she took this petition to challenge the decisions that were made um, to introduce her sexual history in the, the rape trial. And we intervened in the case to make the argument for ILR across the board on a non means tested basis whenever an application like this is made. So the judgment came out last month. It was really positive, I think. Like, I think RR can be confident and really feel that she's achieved a lot in the sense that the decision was overturned in, in her case, like it was sent, just basically sent back to first instance. Um, for another judge to consider. Um, they didn't, it, it was a five um, judge bench, um, they didn't go as far as introducing ILR, but what they did do was say that the Crown must seek the views of complainers and they must put those views before the court. And even within, I think it was a week of the judgment coming out, new forms were issued um, to the Crown where um, they had to um, put down whether or not they consulted with the complainer and um, what those, those views were. So I think that, that shows you immediately the difference this type of strategic litigation, which is really what it was, um, can make. But in, in our view and in RR's view, it doesn't go far enough. So currently, um, the, the sought leave to appeal to the Supreme Court. So we're just waiting to hear what the outcome of that is. And it'd be quite significant if it's successful because it would then apply across the rest of the UK and not just in Scotland. So what I don't want to take away in, in any way at all from the courage and determination of the women involved in those cases, because I, I think it's really quite incredible to see people putting really significant costs to themselves because of the delays that it creates in the criminal cases, really trying to assert what I think is a human right and doing it not only on behalf of themselves, but for others coming after them. But I don't think that should be their burden to shoulder. I do think it really should be for the state and human rights bodies. Um, when we and they are aware that there's a human rights issue to act through legislation. So there are some discussions in um, Scotland about uh, whether or not we should look at a legislative way forward with ILR, specifically around sexual history and character evidence. Um, two lawyers in Keene and Tony Convery did a report into how this might work in Scotland within an adversarial system, looking very much at what, what happens in Ireland where they, they have this right. So discussions are ongoing with the Scottish Government and I, I am relatively optimistic that we might see some progress legislatively um, while we wait and see what happens with the Supreme Court. So I'm aware of time. I just want to quickly say 
why I think Aguilar makes a difference and why we, we need it in the very least for disputed areas of privacy, such as sexual history, medical records, mobile phone data, social media. And that is because complainers simply cannot rely on the Crown to protect their interests. And I don't see this in any way to criticise individual prosecutors who work extremely hard, but fundamentally, it's my view the Crown are incapable of fully representing a complainer's interest just because they're not directly representing the complainer. And what, what we know is that the criminal justice process for sexual offences is characterised by trauma, a feeling of disempowerment, a complete lack of agency, often mirroring, as, as complainers tell us, the experience of sexual crime itself. And that I think if we can do anything that introduces more of a sense of agency and less alienation for complainers, then the onus on us is on us to do that. And I just want to refer briefly to, we've had two civil rape cases um, now in Scotland, one falling on from um, a failed, I think like a no prosecution, and the other from a prosecution or not proven verdict. These are civil damages cases. Both have been successful. And in the most recent one, um, Miss M, who is the woman in the case, has spoken really eloquently about why the civil case was, was such, a, such a more positive experience for her than the criminal case. And not only because of the outcome, but because she felt, because she was a party rather than a witness, she felt she had agency, she had her own legal representation, and that is what made the difference to her. And I think there's a lot we can draw from that. And finally, um, just to finish up, I think IR is something that needs to happen. I think it will improve people's experience, but fundamentally, it is only going to improve somebody's experience within a system that is overwhelmingly traumatising and I, I would say at times hostile um, to attempts to really get justice and I, I think we need to engage with the reason that, that um, law, defence lawyers use this type of evidence and in our view of the crisis Scotland it is because of jury attitudes and often what's been played out in every trial is really regressive attitudes towards women's behaviour and women's sexuality and until we engage with that and engage with the use of juries in rape trials, we probably are sadly just going to be tinkering around the edges of what is a really dehumanising and traumatising process. I feel like doing a standing ovation, like, yes! <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I mean, thank you again. It's, I'm just, everything everybody is saying, I'm just lapping it all up. It's, um, so so helpful I've got a lot to think about I think something that was coming out to me particularly there is the is what you're saying about how yes we've got these like pioneers who are pushing through at great cost to themselves people like Bonnie but actually we know now that there is a problem why are we not addressing it and at the same time these these we're trying so hard to push through on something that actually is also fundamentally broken and we also at the same time as sort of tinkering around the edges with things like legal representation we do need to look at actually how can we have sustainable funding for specialist services because that is ultimately what makes most difference to the survivors is being able to access like bonnie was saying she took 50 uh, 500 attempts to to get through to rights of women actually we need services that are properly funded so that people can get support and get uh, justice. So yeah, I, oh, everything you're saying, I'm like, yes. Um, so we're now gonna hear from our final speaker, um, last but definitely not the least. Uh, we're gonna speak to uh, Dr. Yasin Brunga, who is a lecturer in human rights um, at Queen's University Belfast, as well as the co-director of the Gender, Justice and Society uh, Network. So uh, she is a brilliant and wonderful person, as well as an incredible academic. And uh, her work has been used to um, inform loads of uh, international organizations around the world. Her main focus is looking at what do we actually mean by justice, particularly around uh, sexual violence within conflict and post-conflict societies. So hopefully Yasin will be able to sort of really put some context here in terms of a, a properly international perspective. So I will stop talking and let Yasin say her bit. Thank you. Thank you so much, Olivia, and um, thank you for this um, 
opportunity to be part of this conversation. Um, I'm just going to stick on my little timer here, otherwise I will talk over <laughs> seven minutes, uh, just to remind me. Uh, I really want to make uh, two interventions, which I think will sit well with everything we've heard um, from my co-panelists. Um, and the first one is going to be on the question of what we actually mean by legal representation. And the second intervention is really centered around the question of race and sexual violence and what are we missing. So let's start off with uh, the, the actual meanings or, or meaning we attach to legal representation. So in this paper I'm writing, um, one of the things I want to tackle straight off is for all of us to have a candid conversation about what the representation means in this instance. So specifically, are we talking about representation where we're representing the criminal justice system to the victim? So we're needing an actor to act as the conduit to explain the rules, the procedures, the kind of uh, uh, legalese, the kind of culture of criminal justice that if you're a barrister or a solicitor or those, that are, or those of us that are familiar with the system, we're, we're the insiders. So we're explaining it to a victim and a survivor who is effectively the outsider in this system but nevertheless it is, is so instrumental to moving uh, a potential uh, investigation and prosecution forward. So I want to challenge us and, and ask us, what do we mean by representation here in terms of the role of this particular actor that we're thinking? Is it alternatively about representing the victim's interests, the victim's perspective, experience, wants, needs, thoughts, the victim's lived reality to the criminal justice system. So we're, so we're starting at a different direction. We're starting by locating ourselves um, centrally uh, to the victim and survivor that we're talking about, and then being so being an actor that amplifies that to a justice system that has yet proven itself to be, well, I'll, I'll just say it, <laughs> unwilling to really understand the impact, consequence and devastating harm that sexual violence um, has on survivors and the amount of courage and bravery it takes to report and even engage with the system. I would love for us to talk about this. I would love to hear uh, uh, my co-panelists perspectives, but in the paper I'm writing, I, 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 I explore that and I explore how we should perhaps think about representation as being multidimensional. So maybe it isn't about either of those things. Maybe I'm reducing it to a binary that it doesn't have to be either or, it can be all of those or something else. Internationally, when I uh, work with organizations that um, particularly focus on sexual and gender-based violence, and particularly for me in the African context, so be it in the Gambia or in Uganda or Kenya or South Africa, what is compelling for me as a lawyer is uh, the humility to which law can take a step back and see how victims and survivors mobilize themselves uh, in trying to seek support, healing, and justice. And by that, I mean, in instances where we know the criminal justice system is uh, a difficult path, that doesn't mean that victims necessarily are always silenced or sit back and, and, and have to sit with that pain and suffering. What I've seen is an incredible mobilization where organizations that are led by survivors, organizations that um, have sought to make sure that victims and survivors are front and center in any discussions about justice, uh, criminal law, international criminal law, have really, have really confounded my expectations of what the legal system can do in terms of actually listening and being orientated towards including victims and survivors in a different way than we're used to. It forces us to think about departing 
from the architecture of the adversarial system here in uh, uh, the, the UK jurisdiction that I'm, that I'm referring to and certainly familiar with, a departure from that and, and thinking what else could we imagine. So thinking about legal representation for victims of sexual violence is one such imagination, but I see others. So for instance, why does it have to be a legal representation? When if we think about it, who is most proximate to victims and survivors? We've already heard um, from Bonnie the incredible work that uh, her lawyers, uh, her solicitor Harriet has done. And I've heard many stories from survivors who talk about lawyers and legal actors, police officers who have been amazing. But also, and I'm sure we can all agree that there are plenty of stories of the opposite where legal actors, lawyers, police officers, um, even judges have failed in any kind of ethics of care, um, understanding, empathy to what is the harm um, that an individual comes to the criminal justice system with. And I think, therefore, when I think about legal representation, I wonder if there is space for us to think about non-legal representation, either in tandem or uh, uh, working together um, with, with, with victims and survivors. So if you're working with Women's Aid or Victim Support or South Hall Sisters or a number of different organizations that work in much closer proximity with victims and survivors, why do we not allow them more engagement in the process if we are then asking to include victims more into the legal system. And I just, I, I, I suppose, again, it's an invitation for us as a group, as a collective here, to think about that uh, 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 in our discussion. Or is it that we find that retreating to the framework of the law offers us um, the quintessential things that we're looking for within the legal system. It protects the rights of the defendant. It fits within the framework of the adversarial system. We can set around rules of procedure, of evidence, and we can determine at what stage victims rep representatives are being involved. If it's a non-legal actor, then we're forced to imagine something differently because we're, we're departing from the legal realm in the way that we're used to seeing it. And so again, um, in this paper, I explore what it means having seen other examples in jurisdictions where the legal system has really not been the place for seeking justice. And so victims have had to think more creatively about how they engage with that. I want to move on to the second point of my intervention, which is really about race and criminal justice system as a whole and how it links to our conversation here when it comes to um, victims and survivors of sexual violence. Without a doubt, everyone in this conversation has been aware of the global movement that is Black Lives Matter and the call for attention when it comes to racial disparities um, in the criminal justice system, police brutality, the failure of um, the justice system to really um, support, protect, and in fact be a site of injustice for Black people. For Black, Brown people, people of color, minoritized groups, the criminal justice system can be and has shown itself to be a hostile site. So when we're talking about adding an additional layer, an additional actor, let us not forget those who have sat for a very long time at the margins of the criminal justice system. So when I think about independent legal representation for victims of sexual violence, I think about black women, I think about indigenous women, I think about um, non-binary people, I think about black male victims of sexual violence. And I think about how they perceive the criminal justice system already. What is their status quo when it comes to this legal system? Is there a trustworthiness there? Is there a credibility there? Is there a legitimacy deficit that exists? 
So in fact, while we are talking about independent uh, legal representation, we could be talking into the void for a number of important constituents, a number of important victims and survivors who should be heard and who for so long have been forgotten in our discussion of mainstream reforms of sexual violence. And I wonder to what extent can we change that? Must we change that? I think for all of us, and it could be something we, again, perhaps pick up on in Q&A, and we have a number of different jurisdictions represented here. But in the paper I write, I, I challenge our, us to think about whether when we talk about victims of sexual violence, we're thinking from the perspective of a, a, a cis heteronormative uh, uh, a person. So we're thinking of a white, able-bodied female. And from that perspective, we orientate the justice system accordingly. But we, we, are, we are failing even with that imagination of the victim in mind. We are failing already there, let alone when we think about and, co and complex and complicate, excuse me, our, our understanding of who are the victims and survivors that we're talking about and talking to and wanting to help and heal and support through their process. I really do wonder. There is plenty of evidence, plenty of research. Yesterday there was um, uh, the, Joint Commission, the Joint Committee on Human Rights released a report on um, kind of black people's human rights in the UK. And in it, they did a poll which came out with the result that 75% of black people in the UK do not believe their human rights are equally protected <clears throat> compared to white people. In that report, which I would um, recommend you read, the committee acknowledges that it's not about searching for more evidence about the way the criminal justice system has um, ill-treated black people. The committee says there's been plenty of reports, but the problem has always been in, implement in implementation in taking recommendations forward. So when it comes to sexual violence, my call to action for all of us is to not forget those people, black people, brown people, indigenous people, people of color who have sat on the peripheries and waited for so long to when the criminal justice system may pay attention to them. And then kind of adding to that and finishing off is I call for us to really take seriously um, how we engage with um, those communities, those identities. How can we take an intersectional understanding of sexual violence that is applicable to every aspect of it, including independent legal representations? If you haven't seen um, there was a black lawyer by the name of Alexandra Wilson, who um, I think it was last week or a few weeks ago, it feels time is odd, um, here in the UK, who essentially talked about her experience as a black barrister and being repeatedly um, misidentified as the defendant. Um, in one instance, um, being told to leave the courtroom I wonder to what extent do we not see how race plays a factor even within the legal profession as well as the legal system itself. And therefore, if we don't pay attention to these complexities, then how, when we're talking about uh, legal representation for victims of sexual violence, who are we leaving behind? Who are we erasing? And who are we rendering invisible and therefore perpetuating further harm of the system um, rather than changing it at its very roots. I finish off with uh, a quote from uh, Sadia Hartman, who's one of my uh, kind of favorite um, uh, authors and, and, and academics and thinkers, because she calls for us to think beyond the given. And even our discussion of, it, of, of legal representation for sexual violence uh, survivors and, and victims is, is, is a call, is, is, is a manifestation of thinking beyond the given. But I wanted my intervention to push our conversation a little bit more widely. Olivia, I'll leave it there. Oh, 
Thank you, Yasin. I, I cannot think of a more perfect call to action than that. I mean, wow. Thank you. And it also, um, you've done my job for me because you've also allowed, uh, sort of highlighted advertised for us. Um, and in two weeks time, we will be having a session on whether or not um, the problems with racism in the justice system mean that we need to abolish criminal justice or criminal legal responses to sexual violence. So I would really encourage anyone who is um, interested in that call to action to attend in two weeks time to see that kind of difficult discussion about okay so what does this mean like what is justice and what does this legal system require of us do we need to abolish it before we can do anything else so I'm gonna um, open up I know we are sort of running out of time but I would um, I'd like to open up to the panel that call to action from Yasin where do you think legal representation fits within this wider need to challenge racism and deeply deeply rooted inequalities within the justice system and is it actually just adding more law to a legal system that is already harmful so uh, i'm just going to leave sort of leave it as a free fall does anyone want to <laughs> try that one out great funny yeah um yes and i'm so grateful to you for raising the subject because it's something that for me I feel as though the sexual violence I've experienced through my life since childhood uh, has more often than not been racialized. And it's just not something that's talked about, uh, you know, and particularly the um, fetishization of East Asian women um, and sexual exploitation, uh, the rise in pornography, I believe, Pornhub last year the most searched for term uh, and the most searched for genre if you can even call it that was Japanese and that's globally so uh, yeah I'm very appreciative to you for bringing that up I, I think for me um, legal representation you know and this is just my perspective would be absolutely essential and uh, my lawyer in Norway is actually on the board of the national PTSD board or something or other. So he's very sort of trauma informed. Uh, my experience of uh, working with Harriet and her colleagues has been that they've got a good understanding um, of that. But again, I think there's much more room for a more intersectional awareness and approach uh, because sometimes I felt unable to really raise the disability side of things or the racial side of things. Uh, in a space where I'm, I don't feel confident that I'm going to be heard. Yeah. Uh, but I, I would feel as though those things are things I want in addition to, and I certainly wouldn't want to compromise on having the proper legal support right from the beginning till the end of the legal process. Harriet, would it be you going to say something other than Sandy? Yeah, um, well, thank, thanks very much for everybody's um, contributions it's so so interesting um, I, I I think um, it's worth mentioning that Incarn um, which is a second tier support organization with BME women's organizations have done a report um, in relation to the access to justice in particularly around sexual violence for black and minoritized women um, we, we are also uh, I mean I think you know that those intersectional questions are very important and disability is 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 a, a huge issue particularly those with mental illness and um learning difficulties um are the the, the, the people who who i mean we, we have a, a massive crisis for all women and we do get a lot of you know white middle class um you know kind of uh professional women who come to us who who are who are astounded at their experiences of the criminal justice system and 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 yet of course those those that are more dis, dis, um, socially and economically disadvantaged, um, it's it's even worse. Um, I, I did also just want to pick, pick up on your other point, Yasin, uh, briefly, which is uh, about lawyers. <laughs> and speaking as a lawyer, um, I, I, I absolutely agree that um, you know if we're going to, if we're looking at taking forward independent legal representation, <laughs> those lawyers have to be uh, you know have have the insight and understanding. Um, and, 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 and there are uh, uh, huge limitations there and huge limitations 
across the criminal justice system and that's part, part of the problem. It's the same with police and with um, prosecutors as well. Occasionally we have people who have great insight uh, but they're huge limitations. Um, I, I always um, remember uh, worked uh, with uh, a woman called Alice Vax who's a, a, speci a specialist sexual crimes prosecution in the United States, wrote a book called Sex Crimes back in the 90s. And uh, she talked about um, in the United States, they have prosecutors who are involved in case building, working with um, the, the um, complainant uh, through the process. So they understand without coaching, so the kind of strict carefulness, but uh, around the approach to, um, uh, you know, just understanding who the person is they're working with. I mean, we have this mad system, which is only very slightly improved here where prosecutors don't even, uh, you know, didn't used to even meet, you know, the, the, the victim never met them until they were in court. And, you know, they would sit through a court sometimes and not know who was the, on their, you know, who was the prosecutor and who was the defense. You know, they, they, so, so that, that lack of contact um, is, is, uh, is, is a problem. But again, you, you, you're going to be limited by the quality of the lawyer. So I think partnership working um, between lawyers and those who are really specialised in and able to support uh, victims, survivors, complainants is, is really, really important. Hi, um, th th thanks so much for that input. Um, we just had a report um, published in Scotland into racism and misogyny within Police Scotland and it really makes for very, very good reading. I can post a link on the chat, but to, at the very least, I think it highlights the need for strong advocacy and also legal representation for anyone engaging with the criminal justice system across our nations. I, I definitely don't think it should be a choice between advocacy support and legal representation. I mean, our, our advocacy support, I see that Una has posted the light to the evaluation it's evaluated so strongly. People say this changed my life. I could not have navigated the justice system without it. But as I think Harriet mentioned, there's a real limit to what we can do. We can't legally represent somebody at the time where they most need it because their rights are under threat. So I definitely don't think we should think that we need to choose between the two because they, they are so complementary. I also think, I don't know how it is in the rest of the UK, but in Scotland, rape crisis services still aren't seen as pretty white organisations and I think the onus is on us to make sure we are fully equipping ourselves and that we're really centering the voices of women of colour or people of colour in their experience of the justice system. And the final thing I, would, I want to say, so there, there's so much here to, to discuss, it's just in Harriet's point about communication between prosecutors and the complainer. That this, this was the same session in Scotland until a few years ago where Complainers would turn up to give the most difficult evidence and they wouldn't even know who the prosecutor was. It's crazy. You, would, you can never get best evidence in these circumstances. We, we now have a policy in Scotland where the complainer should meet the prosecutor pre-trial, but that's been really challenged by COVID. But the best feedback we have had from complainers is where the prosecutor, who's called the AD in Scotland, has met the complainer like say three or four times. That, that, that I think is the best, the best way, at the very least, um, to get best evidence for somebody to feel more confident within a process that is really frightening. Uh, Owner, can, can I just add that, that in, the, in the report that, that I did, the longest chapter of the 18 chapters dealt with marginalised communities, because there is absolutely no doubt that the BAME community, the elderly, the, those with a disability, those in the travelling communities, the LGBTQ plus communities, etc. They, on them is visited the greatest injustice of all. The fewest reports of these crimes come through from, from these groups. The uh, uh, largest dropout is from these groups. And I have strongly, strongly recommended that we start with a, a huge research project by the Department of Justice in Northern Ireland into these groups and that we desperately need uh, steps to bring them within the ambit of the, of the justice system. And if I might say, uh, lastly, it's one of the reasons why I think that uh, in Northern Ireland we've appointed three uh, representatives within victim support to uh, be the legal representatives. And I don't think that's sufficiently diverse. I think you need the width of the legal system, uh, the lawyers within that legal system, if we're going to have a truly diverse system, which will embrace 
uh, people who are quite candidly refusing, with good reason in my view, to come within the justice system because it simply at the moment is not affording justice to them. Thank you. And I think um, just sort of reflecting on what everybody is saying, I think it really shows the need actually that when we're talking about legal representatives, that we think about who those representatives are and where, who they're speaking for. And it needs to be by and for. It's, it's that common thing of we need to make sure that we are not just repeating the same old white services for white survivors, because we know that um, minoritized groups know that they're not really, it's not really for them because it's, it's, they can see that it's mostly white middle class women who are doing things. Um, and I also think it, it feels like what Bonnie was saying about needing to um, have specialised training. So in Norway, Bonnie's lawyer is, is trauma informed, but also we need a, a racism informed and an ableism informed um, sort of set of representation. So we need to make sure that there is specialist representation that is trained in the inequalities of the justice system. And also it really raises some questions about what the remit of this representation should be. If there are some quite clear racial stereotypes or ableist stereotypes going on in court or in the case preparation, should there be an ability to challenge that or to raise awareness of that, even if it doesn't comply with one of the very strict privacy rules? Um, and that is a big question um, that I am not gonna allow you to answer because our time is up. <laughs> so I'm so sorry. Um, but I just want to say thank you again for everything that, um, you have all said. I, there is so much to think about and I really hope that we can continue these conversations. An hour and a half was never going to be enough, um, but we try to have these kind of brief introductions in our webinars. So thank you again and I really hope that we can continue these discussions going forward. Um, so thank you. Is there anything that anybody has a burning desire to say before I um, leave? <laughs> no pressure. Brilliant, then thank you. And um, I just, yeah, we'll say thank you once again. Uh, for those of you who are still here, please um, do complete the feedback form that um, Tommy has put the link for. Um, and yes, thank you again. <laughs>